<laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, it's very nice to see that, uh, that we have a good uh, number of folks participating today. And there will probably be more joining us. Uh, the meeting is meant to, or this event is meant to start at noon. So um, in the interest of providing as much time for our authors and for you, the audience participants as possible, I'll just go ahead. Uh, my name is Jeff Longadoc, um, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. And as executive director of CASI, which is the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural event in our Astro 2020 virtual series of presentations. The CASI Astro 2020 conference originally was to have been held in June in Toronto. However, COVID-19 necessitated a change in plan, as you might expect. And we've arranged with many of the authors whose abstracts had been accepted into the technical program of the conference to participate in these online sessions. The sessions will be run essentially as they would have been during a typical on-site conference. So as an audience participant, we'll try to emulate or to simulate the kind of experience you would have in a room when everybody would be all together. Today, we have four presentations um, and um, the event will be managed by a moderator, um, Gang Lee. I'll be introducing um, all the folks in a minute and there will be an opportunity for audience interaction. The session is scheduled for 90 minutes. Authors will have about 15 minutes each to complete their presentations and questions and comments are encouraged from all of you out there in uh, virtual land. Uh, if you've logged in using Zoom, you'll see a chat button somewhere on your screen. Um, that's how you would submit a question. You select this feature and direct your comment to everyone because you'll have an option. I mean, if you wanted to go to everyone, You'll have an option in the chat function to, um, to select one person or all. Please select everyone so that all participants can view your input. Um, the moderator will decide whether to direct questions to the authors immediately after each presentation or collectively following the last presentation or perhaps both. Um, assuming the, ne the necessary permissions are received, Cassie will post a video of the session for the benefit of those who could not attend today's event. So that's it for my housekeeping announcements. And now I'd like to introduce um, the participants in today's virtual session. Um, first of all, uh, will be uh, the first presentation will be by Lucas Santaguida. Uh, Lucas is a student at York University and uh, currently um, is involved, uh, well, he's been uh, a student at York University's Lausanne School of Engineering. Um, starting in 2020, he began the position of satellite operations engineer at Telesat, uh, Canada, located here in Ottawa. Uh, the second presentation will be given by Junji Kang, who also uh, is at York University. He's a PhD student uh, in the Department of Earth and Space Science uh, at York. Uh, the third presentation will be given by Justin Den, who is uh, at the National Research Council of Canada uh, and is in his final year of his bachelor's degree at Carleton in, as an aerospace engineering student. Uh, recently had a 12 month co op with NRC in aerospace manufacturing technology, the AMTC, previously AMTC, uh, here in Ottawa. And uh, the final uh, presentation uh, will be given by the moderator uh, of today's session, uh, Dr. Gang Li, who is a senior research officer uh, in the aerospace um, division of the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, following the presentations um, and the questions and answer part of, of this uh, session, um, I'll wrap things up, thank everybody, and, and uh, give you an idea of what our next uh, virtual session will be. So that's it from me. And uh, now it's my pleasure to hand things off to Gang Li to run the session. Uh, 
and I'm not hearing Gang. Looks, it's your turn to give the presentation. All right, thank you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just in time to hand off. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucas Santaguida, and under the supervision of Professor George Zhu at York University, I conducted the evaluation of adaptive fuzzy PD control for autonomous spacecraft rendezvous by air bearing testbed. There is a tremendous number of space debris in orbit. There is currently 34,000 objects larger than 10 centimeters, and uh, and an estimated 170 million pieces smaller than 10 centimeters in orbit around the Earth. The number is already large and is going to increase at an exponential rate. We are reaching a point where we will hit a critical number of debris that will spark Kessler syndrome. Kessler syndrome is the point that there will be so many objects in space that just one collision can cause a chain reaction of collisions, completely cutting us off from the space environment. There are many methods of capturing objects in space, ranging from nets, harpoons, and magnets. Another method is using a robotic manipulator as it opens up the possibility of spacecraft servicing. Recognizing the limitations and costs with traditional capture methods, many agencies have exp expanded the scope to not only remove debris, but to create satellites that are full space servicing vehicles. This would produce a vehicle that can perform multiple tasks, such as refueling, upgrading, repair, maneuvering of existing space objects, and deorbiting of debris and satellites. This allows for the reduction of debris, the reuse and life extension of existing satellites, and the recycling of space satellite parts in orbit. For customers of servicing spacecraft, the lifespan of their existing satellites can be extended, removing the need to launch replacement spacecraft, reducing total cost. For the developers and operators of these spacecraft, it offers an effective solution for removing debris and providing a profitable servicing solution. These servicing vehicles consist of a base satellite with an attached N degree of freedom manipulator to perform the capture and on-orbit servicing tasks. There are many different test beds for simulating the space environment, but all have their limitations. The most common testbed is the neutral buoyancy simulator, which places these objects in a pool to simulate the microgravity environment. These technique, techniques have high resistance on manipulator joints and require hardware to be waterproof. Another is using a hardware in the loop system where motion of the satellites and the manipulator are simulated and then transferred to the motion of the industrial robots. The limitation is that the microgravity environment is simulated but not replicated, which neglects the disturbances it would experience. The accuracy is limited to the accuracy of the industrial robots and the simulation software. All other notable test beds have high restrictions in the testable workspace and test duration. To test out the controller and the other algorithms, an air bearing simulator was developed at York University. This simulator uses air bearings, which provide an air film to, for the simulator to float on to simulate the microgravity environment. Commonly used surfaces are glass and smooth finished granite slabs. Air thrusters are then used to translate and rotate the simulators. Then a robotic manipulator is added to the simulator for on-orbit servicing testing. Air bearing simulators offer the most accurate way to mimic the microgravity environment, replicating the near zero G low friction conditions while providing the same comparable disturbances that a servicing vehicle would experience. This makes air bearing simulators the best platform for on-orbit testing. The limitations of air bearing simulators are that they are limited to the operation in a plane. This limits testing to two translational and one rotational component, whereas a spacecraft would have three tra translational and three rotational components. For the simulator to uh, determine its own position, a star tracking system was developed by the previous master student. The system uses infrared LEDs on the ceiling and a camera on top of the simulator to determine its own position. To demonstrate the position, to determine the position and orientation of the target simulator, the chaser simulator is equipped with a tracking camera. The tracking software was written in C++ using OpenCV in the Uruko library. An Uruko marker was placed on the target satellite. The Uruko marker makes use of the known size of the marker in the four corners to determine the position and orientation using a single camera. 
There are two paths that the Chaser Simulator follows. The first is the straight line approach representing the path that the servicing spacecraft must perform to close the distance to the target. To determine the straight line path, it uses its known position using the star tracking camera and the observed position of the target using a monocular camera. It then plots the path between the two satellites. Once within the capture range, the chaser will begin the circular synchronization path. With the difference between the current and desired position and its rate and change, it is then fed into the PD controller to get a vector of forces for position and rotation. To maneuver and orient the simulator, the thrusters are used. The simulator has eight on-off unidirectional thrusters, which are simplified to four bidirectional on-off thrusters. After determining the required force in the inertial frame, these are then mapped to the thrusters in the body frame using the C matrix and the pseudo inverse. This produces a matrix that of the required forces for each thruster. As the thrusters are on off, they must be thresholded to limit their activation. If the required force exceeds that capable by the thruster, it is turned on. Depending on the sign of the force, it is mapped back to the eight unidirectional thrusters. Examining past, planned, and future missions, the manipulator's length and mass can be determined as the ratio of the base simulator's length and mass. The length was maximized to fall within the constraints of the test, uh, test bed table. The manipulator was designed to have the same number of degrees of freedom as the base simulator and is the minimum number of degrees of freedom without redundant joints. Two air bearings were added to keep the manipulator level. To remove unwanted torques by gravity and thus removing any additional friction at the joints caused by the links rubbing. On the end of the manipulator is a two finger gripper with a cone like docking probe. The docking probe allows the system to soft dock with the target, helping guide the manipulator into the correct orientation. All the manipulator path planning and actuation was programmed to avoid experiencing kinematic singularities. So this is a demonstration of the uh, simulator uh, uh, operating. Uh, it's going to first perform the straight line path to approach the target and then perform this uh, synchronization maneuver. And once within the capture criteria, the robotic manipulator activates to capture the target. This is making use of the path planning algorithm, thrusters, star tracking, tracker, tracking camera, robotic manipulator, and the PD controller. For many capture methods, especially those using a robotic manipulator, the final approach and rendezvous is a key orbital maneuver. The spacecraft must be able to approach and capture the target. For a servicing spacecraft that would perform multiple captures, a controller must be developed to optimally approach the target and conserve fuel. This then increases the total number of captures, increasing the service life and profit of the satellite uh, spacecraft. The challenge with the PD controller and the on-off thrusters is that when the simulator is close to a waypoint, it'll be under-actuated and cause the simulator to drift. This would cause the simulator to oscillate, exchanging its errors between state coordinates, taking a longer path, increasing the time and fuel needed. So the research objectives were to create a controller that would allow for the operation in the under-actuated region of the PD controller. This will then reduce the total time spent and path length for approaching the target spacecraft. This then reduces the total fuel needed as the spacecraft would reduce the number of corrections and oscillations caused by the other drifting state coordinates. This is achieved by performing gain scheduling on the original PD controller to prevent oscillations about a waypoint. By adjusting the gains, the controller can actuate thrusters in the region originally left under actuated by the PD controller alone. The gain scheduling is achieved using fuzzy gain scheduling. The fuzzy logic chosen to perform gain scheduling is a first order Sugun fuzzy model. The input is the error in position for the waypoint. As the simulator gets closer to a waypoint for one of its desired state co uh, coordinates, the, it will then hold it with zero velocity. This is an important correction as the PD controller would constantly swap its errors between its states trying to achieve a waypoint. There are three regions of interest for the fuzzy model. The first is the under actuated region followed by negative and positive PD regions. These regions represent being within a waypoint and outside of a waypoint. Outside of a waypoint, the controller will behave with the same fixed gains as the original PD controller. Within the under actuated region, the controller will be mapped to membership function two, having a higher holding gain. The defuzzification process is simply a weighted sum which determines the membership of the gain between the standard PD gain and the higher holding gain. This allows for a smooth transition between the holding and PD gain. This process would work well for a linear straight line path. 
two state variables remain constant in the body fixed frame, allowing two states for the controller to be fixed at the higher holding gain. This allows it to follow the straight line path more closely. This will perform as the PD controller for a circular path as all three state variables are constantly changing with each new waypoint. To compare the results between the PD controller and the adaptive controller, the simulator was, uh, was to travel the same path towards the stationary target. This was repeated four times with different start travel conditions. The average improvement for the linear far range approach for this adaptive controller was about approximately 47%, and the average improvement for the circular synchronization maneuver was 0.63%, which is considered negligible. This produced the expected results. So in conclusion, a PD controller and adaptive controller using fuzzy logic was implemented and the performance results were compared. The use of the adaptive controller showed a 47% improvement over the PD controller for a straight line path, um, but there was no performance increase for the circular uh, path, which was the expected results. This is a list of the references I used for this presentation. And thank you, and if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Look. Uh, look at the questions. Uh, what somebody may ask a question to you? Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to pull up the uh, the chat. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Why did so? The question is, why did the adaptive controller underperform during the synchronization maneuver? Um, so the adaptive controller, um, with the adaptive controller was designed so that it would be able to hold uh, a particular state coordinates when performing, like for example, the straight line path. When the straight line path uh, is operating, two of the state coordinates are remaining constant, um, and that's why it was able to perform uh, better because it's keeping two of the states uh, constant and not oscillating between them. However, with the circular path, as the waypoints are constantly changing, it's always operating in the under actuated region and therefore it's not able to make use of the higher holding gain uh, caused by the fuzzy logic, uh, fuzzy gain scheduling. Good. Okay, do you have a, maybe you can answer one more question, do you? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Lux. Maybe you can answer that question privately. Based on time schedule, you are very good. Next presentation will be given, given by Junjie Kang. Junjie Kang, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, okay, uh, is my screen on your desktop? Yeah. Okay, uh, today I will give a uh, presentation about my uh, previous work uh, regarding to the uh, space tether system using to uh, uh, remove the rotating space debris. Uh, my, uh, I was under supervisor, uh, under the Supervisor uh, by the Professor George Zhu uh, from York University. Uh, this is the uh, uh, contents for today's talk. Uh, first, I will give a brief uh, uh, introduction about the background about uh, my research uh, regarding to the space debris and the space test of the system. Second, I will give the uh, uh, dynamic modeling about, about the space test system. Uh, third, I will uh, propose some uh, the designed uh, controller strategy. Uh, next, I will show in the simulation result about the space tether system in space. Uh, last, I will give the uh, experiment validation uh, about the spa uh, proposed uh, space tether system on the LBM table. So, uh, yeah, uh, as Lucas, uh, introduced before, we know that uh, we all know that space debris are currently the big issue of, of affecting our uh, space activities now. Yeah, starting from the 1957 uh, to currently, 
the we can see from the picture that the debris are increase, increasing dramatically. And uh, currently, the some researchers already predicted that if we we do not start to uh, start to clean up the space debris, our space our sp uh, space will be for, uh, filled, uh, coordinated by uh, by the the space uh, space debris. So we cannot uh, send any new we, we cannot send or launch any new spacecraft or rocket to even the satellite into the space to doing the space exploration. Uh, Uh, so the space tether system is a uh, is, is can be simply uh, uh, think uh, consider as two two targets that are connected by a space tether. Uh, the purpose of the space tether system can be used to doing the space uh, the uh, propulsion and also for the momentum exchange and also uh, even for the space formation. For there are a lot of the research interest in, regarding the space tether system. So uh, about uh, using the space tether system to uh, doing the space uh, debris remover, uh, the main operation is from, we can, first we can deploy a space tether uh, target to capture uh, a target. Then you, because that the target is rotating, usually is rotating in space, so we, we should, uh, uh, if the rotation speed is very high, we have to uh, proceed the despain or the detabling to make sure that uh, the system will not uh, go into unstable. And then after that uh, system is becoming stable, we can proceed, we can find a thrust to drag this uh, target to, uh, to a higher orbit or doing the deorbit. Uh, so the tether system in space, we can roughly, uh, the overall dynamics can be uh, simplified and the uh, orbital motion plus the relative motion in the orbit frame. So here we give that to the uh, modified uh, uh, orbital elements that we is signality free that uh, we can we can do in this, this for all the uh, incarnation angle and uh, in centricity. And then we can uh, quickly uh, set, uh, establish the dynamic modeling, uh, dynamic model in the uh, relative uh, orbit frame so that uh, we can get that the RE represents the uh, space target's position and the R2 rep uh, represents the target's position in local frame. Then we can get to the Drivers the equations uh, fo following that uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, Newton New Newton Newton section law. Yeah, then we can get the uh, equations in the uh, relative orbit. So next, uh, I will present three different uh, uh, control strategies. First, uh, the tether tension control. So we this proposal is to regulate the tether lines to try to uh, regulate the tether lines to stabilize the tether system. Uh, second, I will present the target's uh, uh, attitude control. So we are assuming that uh, here, we are assuming that the tether is fixed lens and uh, we, we do not change the, its lens and uh, we only doing the controller on, on the tags um, from uh, on the target. And uh, here is actually the Debris, we are assuming that is here the debris was con uh, considered as a uncooperative, uh, uncooperative target. And next we are combining these two and uh, as a hybrid uh, controller. And we will extend this into a velocity, velocity, velocity free mirror. Okay, so here are some, uh, we are doing the simulations within the space. So we are assuming that the, uh, uh, systems orbit start at uh, uh, ge geostationary orbit, and uh, the mass of the debris are uh, uh, one uh, fifteen hundred kilogram, and the target uh, uh, 
was uh, spinning with 6 degree per second and uh, the mass of the target with, is 500, gra uh, 500 kilogram and the thruster was 20 Newton. We compare all the, all, uh, all the, uh, all the, all the controller strategy and the uh, first one we, 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 uh, we do not apply any controller. We just uh, directly uh, toying it to toy it to uh, the orbit. So we can see that from uh, the simulation, we got that uh, this is a uh, orbiter's pro, uh, proportion uh, propagation uh, during the uh, during covering by the space target, and uh, we can see that the here the A was represent the the orbit heights is actually changed from changed one thousand kilogram in one hour with is using the uh, the space tether target. And here we have compared that to this here, this is the different uh, theta one and theta two was uh, represent the uh, target's angle and the target's angle, uh, attitude angle. So we can see that the, the, from this figure, uh, figure they are all uh, oscillating and but in a decking, decking with a decking uh, chains uh, under the controllers and even for, when, only for uh, when we, if we do not, uh, for case one reference, we do not apply any controller. So that uh, seems that the, the, <coughs> the angle doesn't uh, change a lot, does uh, almost keep the same. Um, but uh, after we apply the controller, the decade, the, uh, the angle decade very fast. Uh, here are the uh, tether angle. It's actually the the main tether between the tether target and the tether target. So we are found the similar change with the before. And here the, the this is the variation of the tether length. We we set up the start from the two hundred and goes to the uh, two and uh, two hundred and fifty. So after the simulation, we we got some. Uh, we found that uh, using the space. Uh, Tag system, we can transfer the, we can deorbit the space debris uh, in uh, to one uh, with uh, 1000 uh, uh, orbit height uh, in one hour. And the, this design, the controller stretches are works very well. And uh, the added, uh, the magnitude, the attitude of the angles both for the space tag and the space target are taken very fast during the uh, maneuver process. That means our the design the system is stable, work is stable. So next we, we are proposing to validate the uh, proposed concept on the aberrant table for which can simulate in the microgravity force. So we actually use that uh, two simulators on the uh, aberrant table and we uh, Collecting, co connecting these two simulators with a, a, a triangle tether of uh, structure. This two tether is actually the uh, elastic tether and this tether is uh, more rigid than this one. So after we, we set up this, we were applying a, a towering force in along the X direction so that when, if, when this system was moving in X direction, we will apply, uh, manually apply uh, initial speed, and here that uh, the, this we we assuming that uh, uh, the target doesn't know the information from the target. So uh, first we need we are mirrored we that the elastic tethers uh, stiffness because we have to uh, we we are doing the comparison the simulation and the with the uh, experiment result. So we needed to know that uh, stiffness and uh, we using the tensor uh, for force measurement equipment and we got that the mean the mean of the uh, stiffness of is around the uh, 30. Uh, then we doing that uh, uh, experiment uh, on the iron barren table. First we give we will give uh, apply a, a negative the three uh, spin rate and then apply the controller onto the uh, tag to see that if the, the, the trajectory will 
the motion of the, the system will stable mode. So we can see from the, when we apply a very small uh, spin rate, the system works very very well and uh, during during tapering. Also, next, uh, uh, these two are actually similar, and uh, but we change the different uh, spin rate. So when we change it to the ten degrees, we found that the system was not working well because that uh, the tether we are going to slack because that uh, we only apply a 0.4 newton uh, tapering force. So. Uh, because that uh, our uh, simulator was not uh, uh, very uh, powerful to supply a uh, high uh, thruster. So this is a comparison result with the simulation uh, simulation and the experiment. We can find that the target and uh, the target's uh, uh, attitude is uh, uh, very is concentrated with the simulation. The simulation and the experiment are concentrated very well. And uh, they are decking, if we simulate it for a longer time, we can see that the decking uh, change is very obvious. Okay, uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Junjian. You completed your presentation in time. Maybe you see the question and you can answer some questions. Okay, sure. Uh, oh, I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see any question. Let me. Let me. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. I I think I didn't see any questions. I think maybe we, I don't. I don't. Oh, maybe people any. would ask you later. You can privately answer their question. Okay. Uh, sure. No more question. Okay. Uh, if this day uh, Wendell Shear, Justin, it's your turn. All right, so uh, hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Justin Den, and I am here on behalf of my colleagues, Ali Marathi, Mackenzie Bauer, Ann Fagnan, and Taxi Ramachandra. Uh, my presentation today is on cost-effective screening of hypersonic ceramics. So here's a general overview of the presentation. I'll first start by stating the objective. I'll provide some background on hypersonic flight and atmospheric plasma. I'll describe the experimental setups for atmospheric plasma apparatus and an oxyacetylene apparatus. I'll then present the results for both atmospheric plasma and oxyacetylene, uh, followed by a concluding summary and a brief introduction into phase two testing. So the objective of this project is to develop a quick, inexpensive, and meaningful screening procedure to evaluate refractory materials that are candidates for application on hypersonic platforms. Now, a practical method is needed to evaluate these materials before they are subjected to hypersonic flight. Typically, hypersonic applications only require materials to withstand high temperatures for a short period of time. However, standardized tests used to evaluate these materials require a much longer thermal soak time. So the NRC has been investigating atmospheric plasma and oxyacetylene torch rigs to develop this cost-effective screening procedure. So hypersonic flight, what is it? Well, uh, hypersonic flight typically occurs at speeds of around Mach 5 and above. Uh, um, and Mach 1 is equal to 340 meters per second at sea level. However, this definition can uh, vary due to individual changes in airflow, such as dissociation ionization and several other regimes. The leading edges of hypersonic vehicles can see temperatures well above 2000 degrees Celsius and can be hit with corrosive plasmas from the Earth's atmosphere at a blade of speeds. To mitigate these conditions, ultra high temperature ceramics are used as thermal protection systems. Some applications include missiles, 
hypersonic aircraft and re-entry vehicles, such as the one seen here, the space shuttle, which is covered with more than 20,000 ceramic tiles governed by the black regions. So atmospheric plasma, what is it and how is it produced? Well, atmospheric plasma is essentially a flow of superheated electrically ionized gas. It can be generated when a compressed air is passed through an energized electrode to produce plasma, which is the fourth state of matter. Atmospheric plasma reacts with a sample surface, converting its matrix into products of carbon dioxide and water vapor. All of our tests, however, have been conducted using graphite samples, with which have a carbon-based microstructure. Therefore, we really only expect to see carbon dioxide within the products. So the experimental setups. For the atmospheric plasma apparatus, the APS plasma flux torch system was used for this screening procedure. The system consists of a working chamber, a plasma generator, power supply, a 3D robotic stage, a waste collection system, a plasma pen, and a mounting fixture. The working chamber allows gases and particularly byproducts to be exhausted through a HEPA air filtration system. For the oxyacetylene apparatus, the setup consists of acetylene and oxygen supplies, an oxyacetylene torch with a size three tip, a pyrometer to measure surface temperature, a sample fixture, and a guard-on gauge to measure heat flux. An oxygen to fuel ratio of 1.35 was used while testing graphite samples. So the experimental results, uh, we will first look at atmospheric plasma. So the torch screening method consisted of placing two by two centimeter cylindrical graphite samples in the APS with varying exposure times and working offset distances, which is the distance from the plasma pen to the sample. After exposed to the atmospheric plasma, the, sample were the samples were placed in the digital imaging microscope for visual inspection. 3D scans produced by the digital imaging microscope were analyzed to investigate volume of material removal and the extent of damage caused to the surface. Now, this method is a user-defined volumetric analysis where the user defines the boundaries of the volume. So this analysis is subjective, but is a valuable qualitative tool to characterize recession shape. It was observed that different samples subjected to the same parameters have the same surface characteristics. For example, looking at the presented uh, images on the right side, both possess concentrated damage at the center of, of the sample surface. The recession profiles were non-uniform non and damage uh, in the form of overflow was it could be observed in the top images on both sam samples. So this consistent geometry uh, indicates repeatability. So here's an example of growing recession with uh, an increasing exposure time. And here's an example of the volume measurements method where the user defines the boundaries given by the yellow dots and the, the microscope sets the plane. So looking at the volume measurements data, a relatively linear relationship was observed between screening parameters and recession size. Uh, looking at the left, left side plot, the, as the exposure time increased, the volume loss increased. And with the right side, as the torch offset increased, the volume loss decreased. Now, in addition to volume measurements, graphite samples were weighed before and after exposure to the atmospheric plasma torch to obtain mass measurements. Now, the goal of these mass measurements is to use them to evaluate repeatability and consistency of the screening method. So, looking at the left side plot, as the exposure time increased, we got a linear mass loss increase. And at the right side, as the offset increased, we got a linear decrease in mass loss. So for repeatability, to test repeatability, three sets of parameters were sampled twice. We had a 0.25 inch offset at 60 seconds exposure time, a 0.5 inch offset at 40 seconds exposure time, and a 0.5 inch offset at 60 seconds exposure time. So the experimental error and mass loss seemed to decrease as the exposure time increased and the offset distance decreased. 
And this lower experimental error indicates higher repeatability. Therefore, the atmospheric plasma screening procedure with the mass measurements is a feasible, quantitative, and consistent method. So for optimum parameters, uh, looking at the plot on the left-hand side, the larger the large uh, dots indicate large mass loss. So as the exposure time in increased and the offset distance decreased, we saw much uh, more mass loss. And the atmospheric plasma torch lost its effectiveness near a one inch offset. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have it's just the table for the results uh, for the mass loss portion of the atmospheric plasma testing. So for volume measurements method, relatively linear trends between parameters and resulting volume loss were observed. Visual inspection tool is subjective to user interpretation and small recessions caused by low exposure time are difficult to measure. For mass measurements, they present a fe feasible, simple and repeatable measurement procedure. Uh, they are quantitative and non-subjective and can be combined with the optical validation to show and compare surface characteristics. A clear linear trend was also identified between exposure time, offset, and mass loss. So we now switch our focus to the oxyacetylene testing. So after samples were exposed to the torch, uh, they were placed under a digital imaging microscope for surf, uh, investigation of surface, surface damage. And it was observed that the entire sample surface was oxidized. There was no localized damage that occurred and there was pitting throughout the entire uh, sample surface. And as you can see from the top right image, uh, the plasma plume, or sorry, the, uh, the torch plume was able to access the entire sample. In addition, large pitting was observed concentrated at the center of the sample surface. So here are some additional images of the same sample uh, at a higher magnification and a, um, uh, some 3D scans. So here we can see the sporadic pitting that was observed. So we also attempted to measure heat flux with variable offsets. Uh, and this is the heat flux exerted on the samples by the torch. Uh, to do so, we placed a uh, guard on gauge in the sample fixture and exposed it to the torch. And as you can see from the plot on the right side, as the offset distance decreased, the heat flux increased until a sudden decay was observed. Now it was determined that the, the guard on gauge was damaged by the heat of the torch. So we had this sent for repairs and it has since been returned. So next we wanted to determine uh, the offset distance required to meet, to meet a temperature range uh, from 1600 degrees Celsius to 2000 degrees Celsius without exceeding the upper limit by 10%. So to do so, three graphite samples at three different offsets were exposed to the oxyacetylene torch. We had a two centimeter offset, a 2.5 centimeter offset, and a 6.5 centimeter offset. Now the 6.5 centimeter offset settled at approximately 1500 degrees Celsius, indicating that this offset was too large. However, the two and 2.5 centimeter offsets surpassed that lower limit and settled at approximately 2000 degrees Celsius, indicating that these are within working range. So presented below are the mass loss measurements for graphite samples at a hold time of 30 seconds at a two centimeter offset. So looking at the column on the right hand side, the mass loss column, it can be observed that the average mass loss is approximately 0.6 grams. And based on the consistency of these, these uh, values, the oxyacetylene torch can be considered a repeatable screening method. So in summary, the atmospheric plasma exposed graphite samples typically had concentrated damage on the center of its surface, which was localized and deep, whereas the oxyacetylene exposed graphite Samples seem to have damage spread across its entire surface. The atmospheric plasma machine delivered precise and intense damage while the oxyacetylene torch caused pitting throughout. For atmospheric plasma, the mass measurements method is a cost efficient screening procedure. The results are repeatable, consistent, and quantitative. And the subject subjective optical validation method can be used 
in tandem with the mass measurements as a qualitative tool. For oxyacetylene, the mass measurements method is a cost-efficient screen procedure. The results are repeatable, consistent, and quantitative. However, the volume characterization was not repeatable due to the extent and type of damage, which was uh, shallow, and we had uh, overflow regions at the edges. It just was not feasible to perform volume measurements on these specific samples. So phase two, uh, flow meters using, used during oxyacetylene testing were rated at 100 SLPM. For phase two, we will perform the exact same tests. However, we will be using a flow meter that is rated at 50 SLPM. And this is to improve the accuracy and mitigate flow fluctuations. In addition, we will complete the heat flux testing with the repaired guard on gauge. So that concludes this presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I guess, questions? Oh, thank you so much, Justin. In control the time very well. Yeah. You can answer two questions if you take a look. All right. Um, I'll stop sharing and then. So did you do some mechanical behavior testing to assess the quality of the plasma processed ceramic specimen. Um, no, we did not do any mechanical behavior testing. Um, mostly everything we did, we did um, a working envelope essentially at this point. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we've done at this point, just working envelope, seeing what uh, temp or what working off the, Sorry, uh, working distance offsets and exposure times, and what kind of uh, what kind of damage we see, how much material is removed, um, and what is our most optimal permit parameters for large mass loss. Um, have, you, have you assessed the repeatability of the test method between different torches? Um, no, we have not. It's, it's only been with this one torch with the size three tip. Um, again, with phase two, we will be using different flow meters, uh, which will hopefully mitigate some of the flow fluctuations. Um, but we haven't tried uh, different, uh, different torches yet. That would, that would be a good, uh, good thing though, to, to try as well. So I think so the next one is... Yes, yes, so uh, that's just a suggestion. That's a good suggestion. Uh, select imperial or metric units, gram versus inch is a bit unusual. Yes, yeah, so um, that was uh, largely in part by the, the offset distance of the atmospheric plasma is in, I believe it's in empirical, um, but then uh, all of the testing that was conducted with the, with the oxyacetylene torch was in metric, so. Um, we, yeah, that is, that is, you're right though. We should have it consistent. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Oh, I have plenty of time. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. I'm, I'm glad to present our work. Today I'm going to talk about why modeling work about the uh, damage prediction. This topic is on behalf is the, for the uh, laminate composites. This is, uh, I introduced an approach to model the quasi-static puncture failure of the laminate panel on behalf of my colleague Yun Fa Zhang and Mei Sang Ramat. Acknowledgement, the support from NRC Security Material Technology Program and Aerospace are acknowledged and greatly appreciated. Sincere thanks are given to the people who contributed to the work. Outline covers six sections as an introduction and objective, 
testing details, modeling, results and discussion on a common theory, as well as the concluding remarks. Introduction and objectives. As we know, more and more structures are made from advanced composite materials for the airframe, space structures, armors, extra. This kind of material have very high specific strength and performance. No corrosion has the equivalent or even better than metal materials. By carefully design the layup conditions, quasi-isotropic laminate composites can be uh, produced and can maintain satisfactory in-plane strength as well as in the sickness direction. In this study, a puncture test is selected for quick property assessment. Uh, in this test, we could see the local fracture failure and auto plane deformation. From there, we can understand the panel uh, behavior and the performance for the dynamic response is mod mostly modeled by the explicit approach. That's here some vague information on the failure criteria used for the damage uh, assessment. For the quasi-static puncture test, it is important in building a sound base for a deep study of this puncture strength and failure. So far, there is lack of implicit modeling study because it is difficult to achieve acceptable computational convergence. So the objective in this is to support the testing, experimental testing, by assessing and developing a numerical methodology to predict the failure scenario of a specific laminate composite panel on the quasi-static puncture loading. For the testing part, a uh, eight-ply cross by uh, lay up carbon fiber reinforced laminate panel manufactured from ACP composites. That is a square shaped uh, uh, panel in approximately two millimeter thickness. The outskin are tail fabric encrusted by, and the interior two layers were the same was same the material as outside, but that is a unidirectional sheet. Each of them are uh, zero, 90 degree cross by. The material data as well as the other failure parameters can be found, obtained from ACP composite website. Load frame setup is a MTS load frame with a 98 kilometer cloud newtons load cell were used under the one millimeter per minute uh, to squeeze the panel on the 10 hertz something rate to capture readings. The panel was clamped by two squared shaped uh, 10 millimeter thick aluminum plates with a central hole in 38.1 radius. The puncture in dental was made up by a high string steer. It is kind of a cylindrical section in 12.7 millimeter diameter with a semi-spheric contact nodes. You see the figure one is the setup of the panel. The figure two is obtained the experimental results. The first stage is kind of loading up with a small damage until a big failure the panel lost its uh, load carrying capability. Three, for the numerical modeling, this model, 3D model was created by the Abacus 6.14 version in static stress analysis. Contact relationship was built, was set that has indented to laminate and the laminate itself. And the indenter is very stiff has a very small deformation, so it was assumed a rigid body. And the fine match can be conducted to that one, won't affect modeling performance. And the contact nodes are very fine mesh, and the size is same as the contact 
of the on other side of the pattern one is 0 0.45 millimeter. Uh, and the, this is the one layer thickness 0.5 millimeter thick. The coarse mass created outside. The fine mass was created in the central area in order to apply the boundary condition as well as the good mesh condition, eight concentric circular partitions were made around the panel center. Initially, we tried to use the linear continuum shear elements and want to use the build-in 2D Hartian damage criterion for the fiber reinforced pl uh, plastic material. However, this trial was not successful. As an early abortion without getting the strength, no failure predicted. You see the curve showing the, uh, so the, the top force only reached uh, less than one third of the test the results. So we have to consider other choice, the 3D stress elements uh, to model this one. That would be two directions. One is use the uh, use several team technique. However, it need a big effort. The other one is to use the available building damage criteria for metal materials. This way, we need to assume some nonlinear stress chain curve in the laminates. In this study, three nonlinear stress chain curves were assumed that try to uh, bring big mistake to the original material behavior. That's the first one is kind of the perfect elastic plastic behavior. I reach it's a 600 megapass chance. That's the only uh, deformation, no load carrying capability. Second one is reached the uh, 500 megapascal. Then there's another linear variation reached 1.5% plastic deformation. So the one is kind of from its trans initially material, go to the 700, uh, the deformation is 1.5% plastic. We use the shear failure damage criterion and uh, use the material data, it's 1.8 fracture shear strain to capture the failure. These are results. By comparing the tested and the experimental uh, uh, tested results and the numerical results, it's a good overall good agreement between the two uh, results set. It's uh, you see the stiffer panel found in the model that could be come from the boundary condition under the material uh, stress chain curve assumed overall. Uh, the close agreement, if we compare the strengths, they say all the modeling is underestimate the strengths and the displacement. But relatively, case two and three give a bad agreement. Let me look at the failure conditions. Uh, figure seven is the test uh, coupon. So front surface, that's a big dent in there. From backside, we can see that out of plane deformation and with a cross shaped major crack on the laminate, uh, local failure was success successfully predicted by the modeling. Here is the uh, case one the front surface, back surface, you see, crossed by the, crossed by the crack can be seen. Here is the uh, Case two assumption of the panel is a way successfully predict the failure uh, condition similar to the test the results. This is a case three. This one still can see some uh, cross by counters. From this point, we would say we can try to use the built-in damage criterion to do the quick assessment. Since in the model, we notice that the uh, laminate in the numerical modeling is stiffer, that could be caused by the boundary condition. In the real testing setup, the material slide could slide between the panel and the plate. So we try to lose the 
climb the area, for example, we lose some two millimeter, another two millimeter in, di di uh, in radius to combine with the uh, displacement. We see the, how performance these models are. You see this is a case why the best ones here, the original, the radius is 38.1. Out of that circular area, the panel was fully constrained. Only the first condition is good. The third one, you see the 42.1 millimeter is a two, is a first small failure is terminate there, cannot reach its uh, strength. So this case one looks not that good. But the case two and the three is the could perform better than the case one. And we think the loose constraint to the panel, the soft the panel, the larger the deformation should be. From that point, this case two gave us the gave us this logical variation from displacement. But the strength still in the range has, has some uh, uh, small variation. For the case three, similar uh, trend can be found from the uh, case three. So we would say the, as compared with the strength tested, all the prediction within 10% uh, difference. Another test is we try to see the how effect E3 that is Young's modulus in the thickness direction affect the modeling performance. Uh, we see the first case, uh, use the small E3 value, that's 5.5 gigapa. Uh, in the initial stage is okay, but it's early terminate happened in there. They not reaching the strength in somewhere. And the case two, you see the deformation is close to the first condition. Uh, similar, it's a slightly less than the one. Case three is uh, it's slightly larger. This shows the high sensitivity on the material parameters as well as the difficulty in the convergence issue. Generally, stable predictions was found in case three. In here, you see the, the soft the material, the larger the deformation, then this would lead to the panel can sustain more load from that point, the history is good. So commentary on the damage modeling assessment. It is noticed that it's highly difficult in this damage modeling. In order to practically apply the building damage criterion, a relative relevant analytical base should be investigated, investigated for ensuring reasonable nonlinear stress string curve proposed. The assumed nonlinear behavior has two goals, be able to use the abacus build-in damage criterion for the damage modeling of in composites, and the two, conduct, conduct a fast and reasonable numerical assessment for the laminate puncture strength. And the used 1.8 shear uh, fracture string was from the material data sheet to insert the major shear failure captured was testing. Concluding remarks, so, as we know, based on the viscous elastic behavior in the epoxy material, that will lead to certain degree of nonlinear stress strain behavior in the fiber reinforced composites. Therefore, current assumption of the laminate nonlinear behavior beyond the, beyond the initial linear elastic states should be reasonable. The best product puncture strength within we treat is uh, assuming it's a uh, minus uh, plus minus 10% of the tested strength was obtained from the case three laminate condition. And the numerical work suggests that the current approach using the built-in metal damage criterion is applicable for quick assessment 
of the puncture strength of the current crossed by laminated composite panel. So for future work for achieving the accurate IPE modeling, you need to know to identify the major failure modes from the testing of the material. Determine a theoretical base to characterize the material mechanical behavior for uh, accurately modeling the relevant strength and the failure condition. Understand the intro and the interlaminar failure mechanism with accurate material mechanical parameters and uh, apply customized use subroutine technique to set up the proper <clears throat> criterion to address the major failure behavior for the uh, specific limit, laminated composite materials. Oh, thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Um, so um, this is Jeff back with you. Uh, Gang, thank you very much for, for your moderation. I'm looking at um, any um, questions that may be uh, coming in right now. Mm. Um, there is one that I, or a comment actually, that I'd like to pick up that was uh, mentioned earlier, um, which is that the SAE Committee A22 is standardizing materials for fire testing for aerospace. And this might be something that um, some of the participants in today's meeting would like to check out if that's an area of interest for you. Mm. Um, so I guess uh, if there are no other questions or comments incoming, uh, we may want to wrap up this uh, meeting. Um, I'd, first of all, I guess that this would be my uh, opportunity to thank uh, Lucas, uh, Junji, and Justin for your presentations today that certainly were informative and um, very detailed. <clears throat> and thanks to Gang for uh, moderating the session. Um, I hope you've all found this particular session, the first of our, um, of our virtual series falling out of the Astro 2020 conference uh, to be enjoyable and informative. Um, details about upcoming CASI Astro 2020 virtual series events can be found on the CASI website. Uh, as for the next event, it's being held uh, six days from now on Tuesday, October 27th. The topic is a discussion, <clears throat> pardon me, a discussion on regulatory modernization, updates from government. And I'm just going to go quickly there myself. Um, the panelists uh, for, uh, for this event include uh, representatives from Transport Canada, Global Affairs Canada, uh, I said, and the Canadian Space Agency. And the idea about this particular uh, session is going to be to discuss how the regulatory environment um, for space activities um, ought to be, uh, ought to evolve, uh, to take a look at the way it is right now, the obstacles that the regulatory environment currently um, uh, gets in the way of uh, future developments that are likely to want to push forward in the space arena and um, how um, some of the regulations and the statutory uh, provisions might be modified to accommodate uh, future endeavors in space. More technical sessions will be offered between now and the end of the year, including on such topics as CubeSats, Earth Observation, planetary science and surface exploration, as well as space exploration. And there are a couple of other events that are um, under development right now that I can't uh, say more about than to say, please stay tuned uh, because I think you'll be finding uh, the content of what we'll be offering in the virtual series. Um, we'll cover a wide range of topics and I hope one or more of them will be a particular interest to those of us who are with us today and others as well. Uh, renewed thanks to everybody 
presenting and participating um, on the delivery end of things today, uh, including my call, my Cassie headquarters colleagues, uh, April Duffy and Todd Legault, who uh, have ensured what, as I hope from your end anyway, a smooth uh, delivery. Uh, it looked pretty smooth from here. And um, I hope that um, we'll have the chance to cross paths again, perhaps as soon as next Tuesday at noon. Uh, meanwhile, uh, and always, I hope you'll please stay safe. And thanks again for being with us today. Bye for now. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. <laughs> thank you again, Yang. Oh, thank you, April Talk.